Hi there, and welcome back to Hall 1, and a following hour with an interesting presentation by Tim Clements. It's going to be very much about how you make assumptions about quality when you test gear, and especially CCR gear, and the way we do that testing, and if human factors are considered or not uh, enough during those protocols and this evaluation of gear. And Tim, who is joining us for this presentation. Welcome, Tim. Welcome, thank you. You're one of one in a long row of interesting uh, speakers in this hall one today. Uh, you are recently now very much involved in the Bear Re Red Bear CCR development, and That's you are right. managing a dive site, I assume, in the United Kingdom. Where? Uh, Vovsky in Somerset is where we are today. Uh -huh. Been diving today? Uh, not today, no, no. Um, we've got a swim event on tonight, so that's the focus. Uh, but diving next week and the week after. Ah, sounds great. I'd love to come diving with you someday. If anyone is, is just happening to go to the stage now, you could please take one of the tables in the map. You find them, they are named by several wrecks. And for the rest of the participants, I want you to figure out questions. And in the end of the presentation, which will be roughly around 35 minutes long, Tim, you will be able to ask questions to Tim. So you can join us on stage and ask your questions and have a debate or a dialogue with Tim. Let's see what happens, how it rolls out. So uh, I think everything is set. Your presentation is up running, Tim. So it's yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to begin with a, a short moment of introduction about really how I've got to this point. I've been diving for around about 30 years through, uh, first of all, recreational, fairly um, steady progression towards technical in the 90s, through some scientific diving, some, pur some purposeful task-based diving, um, and really arriving at a point um, in the sort of, I guess, the sort of 2015 kind of an area where I had acquired a full set of diving biases. I had a, a lot of normalized deviance and at that point encountered uh, Gareth Locke, who was lucky enough to be on one of the pilot human factors in diving courses. And really, ever since then, that's fed into a lot of stuff that I've done, running a dive center with a dive team. Uh, the impact of incorporating just little bits each year has been dramatic. And of course, during that time, um, my career progression uh, led me into rebreathers in about 2011. Uh, in 2014, we took over the Sentinel CCR well, after VR and set on a, out a journey, really, at that point to turn it into something that we felt represented rebreather diving. Uh, we went through two rounds of CE testing. I've also been involved in the CE testing for the Explorer ASCR and also the MCM 100. And I have some reflections to share as a result of those experiences um, going parallel with these human factors things here. So really, we're going to kind of look into this today and to look into what we want from a rebreather and whether this CE evaluation process uh, delivers in the way that we might expect human factors to. So a bit of a safety case, uh, CCR, I'm sure many of you are aware, are complex systems. Uh, there are feedback loops between physiological human performance and uh, psychological performance. If we don't have the right gas, we end up in a very different mindset. We can't make decisions. Those decisions might make the gas situation worse. So our CEBSEN testing is an important safety contribution towards the overall rebreather safety. Uh, we can look into that for the first part of this presentation. And then for the second part, bring in some incident analysis that definitely identifies uh, what we call human error at that point, or combinations of non-technical factors that affect the safe outcome or not of a scenario. Uh, there have also been a number of technical developments that accentuate uh, the significance of user actions. And these could be in emerging situations or scenarios where there's no one right procedural answer, but we need to consider what we do with the rebreather in the context of our, our team and, of course, our personal situational awareness can have a bearing. Uh, and there's the whole sort of culture of rebreather diving around this. So rich ground for human factors consideration. My point is, is any of that addressed in CE testing? Could CE testing actually contribute towards safer outcomes in those situations? So. A 
a quick review of our CTO. Then. Yes, sorry. If if you would like to go full screen, all you to do that, you just um, stop sharing for a moment. Okay. And then um, reshare. reshare the window. Make sure you select window. Ah, uh, yes, window. That's the one, isn't it? Gotcha. There we go. Better? Yep. It's good to go. Terrific. Okay. So kind of two main things in CCR functionality that we want. We want breathability. Uh, we need to have a rebreather that delivers good gas to us and the right gas to us over a wide range of physiological conditions and operational resilience. And this really lays down the groundwork for a perception of scenarios or changing factors, uh, cognition by the diver to identify the correct action and the ability to carry that action out until the safe outcome is, is achieved. We also need usability our perception cognition action is no use if it's impossible to manipulate a, a handset or a tiny screen or if we can't see the information um, so the presentation of resource information status is critical um, we can look at all of these scenarios that we can anticipate and break them down into those three sections but here we have a, a, a ce test dive who's very happy as we breathe it has both usability uh, and breathability uh, this is in fact a, a project we did for a sky advert which required a white rebreather and so this is uh, another another varied day out in the world of a diver at Fobster Key. You seem to have, uh, go ahead and select your PowerPoint screen again and then um, you can okay, there we go. advance. Got it, there we are. So, so breathability. Breathability is defined in BSEN 14143 2013 respiratory equipment. Now, first of all, it's interesting to note that the, the basis for this testing is actually uh, personal protective equipment. It's not necessarily diving. So it's not derived from scuba. And we may see initially here uh, a, a bias in the configuration of this standard towards something that's not quite right for us. I'll park that for a moment. Uh, in the standard, it defines safe operation and the, and the standards to achieve safe operation in terms of breathability for oxygen to 6 metres, nitrox to 40 metres, heliox trimix to 100 metres. So far, so good. These are familiar diving scenarios. We can buy into that. A temperature range of 4 degrees to 34 degrees Celsius. Again, right between the goalposts. And the two sections that are relevant to us here are section 6, which defines the performance, and section Sorry, section five, which defines performance, and section six, which defines the testing regime. An example of that is here is a, a lucky red bear immersed in an ANSTI test machine where we apply various breathing and metabolic loads to it and we measure the outcome. So this isn't done with human divers. This is done with objective mechanical testing. So moving on, if we have a look through our BSEN standard, at items from those two section five and section sixes mm -hmm. which relate to breathability and usability so kind of breathability is what we get as a diver and usability is kind of our human factors area i had a quick count up just in the index and there were 42 separate requirements for performance nine which defined the performance of usability in terms of the test regime there are 45 sections which define what we're trying to achieve, and 10, which determine how we're going to test usability. Uh, and given previous speakers and the whole range of human factors, which we're all aware is out there because we're here, we can immediately see that there's uh, possibly the presence of uh, human factors and uh, that kind of thing is not fully developed in the CE standard. However, there is an opportunity. Here's the process which we go through when we're trying to evaluate a rebreather and arrive at the point whereby we can test it. We have a failure mode uh, evaluation criticality, criticality analysis. We have design feedback from that. We do prototyping. We work around that a few times. We go into mechanical testing, which is our, um, our machine. We evaluate the work of breathing. We evaluate hydrostatics and respiratory pressures, how hard it is to get our gas. And then we move on to test requirements and test subjects, practical performance. This is where live human beings give feedback on what it's like to be a human being diving this particular rebreather. So 
we might imagine that human factors should be right in our F Mika. So let's have a quick look at that. The F Mika is a very familiar um, matrix which combines the likelihood and the consequence into acceptable probability. And there are some key things in here which we could look for. So, of course, if we've got a, uh, a usability error, which we're aware of, we could define the likelihood and we could define the severity of not managing to do that. For example, uh, can we arrest the flow of oxygen into the unit? There's one example. And this is, there's a time period specified for likelihood here, which is within a year, but there's no requirement after the uh, C or BS standard is achieved for rebreather divers to go back and evaluate that in terms of ongoing human experience. We could have our test divers and our development team, of course, they can have one set of biases. And we take it out into the whole world and anyone who's been on any rebreather forum ever will discover that that's a very different world which should possibly have feedback back into um, a, a harmonization for a later standard or something like that, but it's not specified. So there is nothing there to learn from the actual experience of the user base. And the um, I think I would express that as the richness of their human factors that are available. So we we'll move swiftly on again into mechanical testing. Now, there are three main things here. We're trying to achieve a provision of oxygen. We're trying to remove CO2. But the thing that the diver will feel as a human being is via the work of breathing. So we have the work of breathing. That's the amount of effort it takes to move the gas around the loop. Uh, we have respiratory pressures, which is, for example, when we descend in the water and our breathing loop, our lung and counterlung combination are compressed, how do we add additional gas? And that's usually via an, auto, via an automatic valve, operates like a second stage. You breathe in, it fires, it adds some diluent, and the rebreather continues to have enough volume for us each breath. So for example, how hard is it to trigger that valve? And then finally, when we've got our counter lung and our lungs and their relative positions, if they're on your back, for example, it'll be hard to breathe in, but easy to breathe out. And if you turn over it with the other way around, or if the counter lungs on your stomach, easy to breathe in because the gas goes uphill, but hard to breathe out. How hard is this when we change through orientations? And again, these are very reasonable operational circumstances. And to measure those is very, very valid. So this is cool. This is all great stuff. Um, my emphasis later is going to be, why aren't we bringing human factors up to this level? And if we have a look at some of these limits in a moment, we can see that they far exceed operational likelihood, giving us a very good envelope for us to judge that a rebreather is safe to use, particularly in an at work environment where we have to provide evidence we've assessed equipment as being safe to use. So here we are, here's, our, here's the um, uh, often quoted work of breathing standard for BSEN 14143. And um, breathing Evaluation here is conducted with uh, a number of bring the mouse in for a second, uh, a number of tidal volumes, so a shallow breath to a really, really big deep breath, a, a very relaxed breathing frequency. This would be as if you were asleep, and this is as if you are trying to rip a porthole off a wreck at 60 meters in a strong tide and you just don't want to get lower, get rid of it. Uh, and then what this translates to in terms of gas circulating around the loop and the variation here between 15 litres a minute going around the loop and 75 is, of course, dramatic. Now, why would we have, why is this higher uh, or this goalpost important here? Well, if we have a CO2 breakthrough, we can end up with extremely rapid, hard breathing uh, because that's how CO2 impairs our function. We need to be sure that the unit is A, going to deliver gas at that rate, and B, can still continue to supply us with oxygen. Which brings us on to the injection of carbon dioxide here varies a lot. And the oxygen consumption rate of how hard our metabolism is taxing the unit is here. Three um, being a very, very high metabolic work rate. Uh, if you were going for a gentle walk, you might be at one. If you were, you know, running a solid PB 10K on Strava, you might be up here at 2.78. And so the end result of this is that we want a maximum work of breathing 
to be acceptable could be anything from 0.95 joules per liter that we uh, work we have to do to get that gas right the way up to 2.75. So a rebreather that says, oh, worker breathing, um, half what it should be in quotes, say 0.48, um, isn't really giving the full picture there. You need to look at all of these in terms to, in order to evaluate a rebreather over its operation, operational range. There's a lot of detail here and more of it is coming up. Breathing cycle, hydrostatic imbalance. We want our divers to be comfortable when they are breathing the rebreather. And what happens here is that we put our unit on a breathing machine and we measure the inspired pressure during exhale. So this is us filling up the counter and breathing out. And then breathing in here. And I've put two rebreathers on here that we've been involved with, the Red Bear and the Red Head. Thanks very much to Olivier Van Overbeek for this graphic, very helpful. And you can see how this varies from here. So the red head is a back mounted cantilon and there is a bias towards, uh, it shifts the whole breathing circle or ellipse downwards because we're pulling gas down from above the diver. The red bear has a cantilon which lives down the back and it crosses the lungs and ends up down here somewhere. And interestingly, that means, follow me carefully here, that when we start to exhale, the gas from our lungs flows into the top part of the cantilon initially, which is easy. And then as that is full, it's pushed down to the lower part of the cantilon, which becomes progressively hard. And we can see here that it crosses over that 0 millibar effort line and continues up here. On exhale, sorry, on inhale now, we're emptying the cantilon, it's easier for the gas down here to be drawn up and into the lungs and at the end of it finally we're taking this bit out of the ear up here and down into our lungs again so again we cross this zero millibar effort line but now this side of it is hard because we're on inhale whereas this side of it was easy before because we were on exhale okay so the upshot of all of that is it matters where your breathing lung is and it also matters what orientation you were in so we can see here the uh, red bear uh, 45 degree pitch here and the red bear zero zero pitch here because the cantilon is so close to the back of the body it gives us a, a very um, similar performance in all orientations the red head which was something we did on the way to the red bear in our learning curve um, changes depending upon whether you are here or here because this cantilon on the back of the human has now crossed centroid and, the, and become slightly easier to breathe in certain orientations. Now, what the last bit of it is, this is, it says that these breathing limits of round about kind of 18 millibars, et cetera, et cetera, must be achieved in all orientations from here, 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 on the back and fully prone. And also with the diver rolling to 90 degrees in both directions. So it's a really comprehensive analysis of how hard it is, of how easy it is to breathe in all of your operational orientations. Great detail and great support for our diver who would like to have gas to breathe, which is all of us. But here is a little example of some test dummy bias. Uh, and if we were live and if we were in a hall, I'd now say, which of these measurements is possibly bogus and not applicable? Um, but since we're not, I'm going to have to give you this answer for free. And it's this one here. So if our counter lung is sat on the back of our diver here, this 140 millimetres or 14 centimetres is crucial. If we have one extra centimetre there, that's an extra millibar. If you have an extra three, it's an extra three millibars. And if we go back one slide a moment, and we look at shifting or expanding these uh, test inhale exhale curves, you can see how adding that on may well start to breach the actual standard. So our very complicated, huge matrix of breathability results, which underpins our performance as human divers, is valid for a diver this size. And that is maybe me, and maybe other people, not so much. 
So they buy it, they think it's safe to use, but then we have issues when we try and train certain people um, because their performance as divers is underpinned by the breathability. And if that breathability is causing them psychological angst, then uh, we're not really going to get much further. Now, a lot of people sort of compensate, learn to breathe. We can do things with rigging, but there's a little bit of a weakness here. Now, there's our, there's our test dummy. So if you're more than 226 centimetres front to back, then uh, possibly uh, your needs are not met by this standard. Right. So after we've done all of that, we move on to something called practical performance. And this is with human test subjects. All the mechanical testing is complete. So we have some assurance for risk assessment purposes that all of this is, is going to be OK. It won't cause our, our, our rugged test dummies here uh, too, much, uh, too many fundamental issues when they come to evaluate the usability of this unit. So the specification for this is a bit lighter than it is, for example, breathability because this is it. Five subjects, three units, 10 dives, each unit by two subjects, and each test subject must dive two units. We have some specified report items, and we have some specified tasks that they do. And the report granularity that we ask at the end is whether it passes or it fails. That's it, it's black or white. Now, there are also some circumstances under which the uh, tests are deemed to fail. And I'll mention those uh, in, a, in a couple of slides time. First of all, let's have a look at the practical performance. So the specification here sounds great. These practical performance tests are to check the ergonomics of the apparatus, its compatibility with other PPE, ease of use, key human factors entry there, and the application of the information supplied by the manufacturer. Does the manufacturer make it possible for someone to assemble this machine and go diving safely? doesn't mention training, but the implication is that that information should be transmitted to an agency, but there's no mention or link to agency training in this standard. So here we are. Here are our sections here. We have under the sort of basic testing, is the harness comfortable? What are the security of fastenings like? Does it fall off? Uh, accessibility and visibility of controls, partial pressure monitor, that's our PO2, crucial diving thing, pressure indicators, what gases have we got in our cylinders, and active warning devices. Can you, if fitted, is the full wording, do you get to see if you've got a dangerous PO2 when the alarm goes off, or is it situated way out here or round the back? Who can see that? It's very important. But that's it. All is specification for breathability, and this is the line for can you see your handset. Clarity of vision, performance of adjustable valves, ease of breathing and any other comments. So there's a there's a wide open bit for the responsible test team to really bring in human factors. But that would require the test team to have some human factors awareness. So functional dive tests, what we can do when we get in the water? Well, we're all going to turn up and have a cup of coffee, a bit of a chin wag because we all know each other, these test divers. We're going to do some donning and doffing. We're going to jump 1.5 meters feet first. We're going to check for no continuous leakage, although by implication, maybe a bit of intermittent leakage is all right. Uh, we're going to check monitors and indicators, but no further um, specific, explicit requirement to check whether they work, whether they're handy or not. We're going to swim at maximum speed for 20 meters. Uh, we're going to switch to the emergency breathing apparatus and we're going to test all diver operated controls. So fine, I can push all the buttons but do I get the information that I need to respond to a scenario? That is left up to the responsible test team to evaluate. And if it isn't in the FMECA and been uh, implemented all the way through, maybe it isn't there to test. So if you haven't got a diver who's aware of human factors, how can they pick this up? Uh, we've also got a full range of arm and head movements, wonderful. Uh, and a back roll entry from 0.2 to 1.0 meters off a boat. Well, I've done loads of those, so that's a great thing to find in there. So what sources of bias could be in this situation? Here we have a test diver for one of the, I think the, the Red Bear series of dives. 
um, is leaping off a constructed 1.5 meter platform into Vobster Key. Uh, that's done just outside the window here. Uh, and there's a smaller po portion of bias possibly caused by this dog swimming around nearby. Um, but there are other biases to consider in this setup as well. First of all, the legal safety conundrum, because in the UK, we're required to make sure that rebreathers are safe to use at work. Now, we use the CE uh, standard, now BSEN, as the fundamental measure that means that we don't have to do all of those breathability tests. We can take that as red, rebreather is safe, because these haven't got a rating yet. So we're kind of taking it on the chin by going, this is safe to use for our people at work, but we haven't proved it yet. So we have to construct something. And that means, of course, that you're going to get people who you feel really know what they're doing, are experts uh, and who are very familiar with the apparatus. And of course, that could bring in all sorts of things like experience bias. We don't see through the eyes of a novice. Uh, we could have authority gradients, whereby we have someone who's been involved in this rebreather for years, and maybe we've selected someone who's not an instructor and just a user. But if they pop their hand up and say, well, excuse me, I didn't find that very comfortable, and someone else says, oh, well, that's because, maybe we're overriding and ignoring that feedback. Uh, there's also the chance of being involved in the future of the project, because if you have been in conversation with a manufacturer to be possibly an instructor, selling units with a fiscal involvement and you turn around and go well, isn't quite what we expected here uh maybe there's going to be no future involvement in the sales of that rebreather which could be a you know diving world's quite hard to operate in that could be significant really i think specific human factors training would be beneficial and in talking through this presentation with gareth uh, he may be very much aware that if you have test pilots in an aviation sense, then there is specific training for them to see through the eyes of a novice. Um, and that would seem to get over a number of these things here. If we have the opportunity to update this standard, perhaps as well as the specification for our breathing machine and our O2 impact test and our electronic earthing test and our uh, hanging the unit up by its mouthpiece with a kilos test and a testing the intermediate hosing with 100 kilos of water to see how much it stresses test and the uh, temperature and the freezing and the cleaning and the robustness and the salt water immersion all of those things that are specified very very tightly perhaps we should specify our test subject involvement in human factors take the opportunity to bring that up to the same level as the mechanical testing that we use because there's nothing there at the moment. I've just cut and pasted everything that there is. So what other drivers are there to include human factors in this CCR testing? Well, I've picked two references out of the, uh, the wide world of available literature, uh, and I've chosen two scenarios to in, in, illustrate them as well, which I think will fit into our, our time that is left. So the first of all is a report by the Health and Safety Executive in the UK from 2011, called Human Factors and CCR. And this is a rich, rich tome. Uh, the second one is The Ironies of Automation in 1983. And that's an excellent summary of the challenge that we face when we take our CCR performance. We go, we've got some electronics. We could take some task loading off the diver to enable them to make better decisions by automating some of these life support processes, perhaps O2 injection. But there are paradoxes there where we have to evaluate how those diver sort of automation systems might work. The scenario I've chosen to use is the O2 cylinder hypoxia, where many divers in the early part of rebreathers being sold in the UK went diving with their O2 bottle turned off. The supply of oxygen in the loop diminished. The symptoms of hypoxia when divers breathe this diminished oxygen gas are well-being and sleepiness, which meant that tragically and many cases this wasn't detected and resulted in what many people felt to be avoidable fatalities. Alarms and controls were implemented to try and achieve that, which meant that we end up with a more complicated scenario and a user interface. So I'm going to bring us on to the examples from the red bed to illustrate those. So first of all, the HSC report in 2011, assessment of manual operations and emergency procedures for closed circuit rebreathers. Excellent. So they covered a lot of things here um, with 
a Sherpa analysis, and I had exactly what that is written down somewhere. And I'm very sorry, I've just forgotten. Uh, it's I can't remember. I have to look that up later on. I'm terribly sorry, but Sherpa is it, and it's uh, something like emergency response potential analysis, uh, human H. Uh, but these are all the sections they applied that to. Human error potential analysis, assembly and disassembly. Do we get in the water with a functional rebreather? Diving operations. Are we able to operate it in all of our diving scenarios safely? A training needs analysis to bring together the requirements of the human being with the specific set of automations and manual and automated actions that we have to confront interface and display recommendations. So what information is displayed? On a CCR, we have a more complicated dashboard for our status. Open circuit, time depth, how much gas has got left, you've got left, maybe your decompression status. On a rebreather, we can add to that the readings from maybe three cells, our CO2 status, where we can either choose to use the Mark 1 human, uh, or we could get a CO2 monitor. There's a there's a clue which one's more reliable there. Um, and also now our time to surface is in there, but we've got an extra uh, gas which is being consumed, diluent and oxygen. Uh, and we've also got possibly uh, a temp stick. So this is a more complicated dashboard. To take 10 or more resource indications in requires some streamlining. And that requires training to operate that streamlining correctly. The final one here is human error potential in non-normal operations. So emergencies, compressed time, rapid decision making possibly, and situations that we didn't foresee. Uh, and in theory, all of these should be in the manufacturer's FMECA, and they are. This report was written with many rebreather manufacturers on board. Uh, Inner Space, VR, Kevin Gurr, Martin Parker of Ins uh, the INSPO, uh, and uh, one more, I think. And they should be specified in practical performance tasks, but they aren't specified in the practical performance tasks. And out of this came a recommendation for onboard checklists. And we've seen some checklist presentations earlier on. Human error education. So be aware of the errors that you could make. Human factors in design and human factors in the EN standard. And finally, there's a recommendation in there for a downstream CO2 monitor to detect physiological uh, circumstances. Uh, problems that could affect you. Now, we're not going to get into CO2 monitors today because there just isn't time. Uh, and the subject of CO2 monitors makes another uh, fascinating illustration because, of course, they've been implemented. They possibly weren't as reliable as they should have been. They can be now, but we've built up a culture of distrust. So how are we going to get over that? As our iron is of automation, the other thing underpinning what we're going to look at next is we want humans and systems to work together. Do we automate the mundane and keep humans for emergencies? Uh, how do we do that if manual control skills aren't used and they fade? Uh, we need long-term knowledge of how a system operates in order to develop new strategies for unusual situations, like emergencies that don't occur every time we go diving. So if we don't know what the solenoid's been up to, injecting our gas, how can we take over when it all goes wrong? Uh, working storage, human store results and not data. So we're not going to sit there and go, oh, PO2 back there was this, 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 and this. We just go, well, it was like green at the start and then it went like red, but a bell out. That's the kind of thing that we're good at storing. The monitoring is very boring, but of course it's very responsible. So how do we keep our attention span in order to do that? Uh, visual display modes, 1983, the whole world of visual display was a rich field that they ahead. And the observation here is that humans without time pressure are impressive problem solvers. Directly applies to CCR because, of course, if we turn everything off, we've got minutes of gas in the loop before it becomes dangerous in which to make decisions. There's no rush. Unless, of course, we've ignored a sequence of early warning things which we might need to be trained to detect. And suddenly we've arrived at a critical moment where emergency action is required but we don't need to be in that room. So uh, I'm going to go for the first video from uh, Tim, please. Uh, and this is a video of a head up display on the Red Bear CCR. We've got a PO2 status monitor. And we can just play that. And you'll see that I've put the HUD over the top of the 
uh, screen which you see on your wrist. And there are some subtitles. So we roll through this and we can see that if PO2 is normal, so it's within point one of the set point, the uh, HUD there is green. If it goes up a little bit, we get an indication which is not too alarming. It's just a different sort of flashing green. If it goes up some more, we bring in another LED as well. And this LED sequence also has benefits for uh, colorblind people because the positions are as unique as the color flashing combinations. And if it went up to 1.6, then it would go red. Now I filmed this at the surface, so I can't really uh, get a 1.6 there, but we are gonna drop it down now to a indication which causes a, a low red at point four. So still breathable, but considered by rebreathers to be a point at which you would want to switch. And here's our red, low PO2 written in clear text across the screen. Excellent, I understand that. If I wasn't looking at this, or I didn't understand what this meant, I look at my handset, low PO2, bail out right now. That's it, be gone, okay? So there we are, that's our, that's our HUD and our screen combo to try and transmit status in line of sight and detail on the wrist. Now in our O2 supply example, if we turn the O2 off, the unit will gradually inject oxygen and the cylinder and the pressure available for injection will drop. If we add a monitor to this, and we can roll this video again, then we can see how the red bear interrupts the broadcast of PO2 to give you an indication there's something else that needs attention. So here uh, we have, if you could go for the video please Tim, that'd be awesome. Uh, what we're going to see here is a sequence whereby normal operation with a green HUD is interrupted by a falling diluent bottle pressure, because this is the one I happen to film. And what happens then is that an alternating blue-green appears. We know that this is a status that requires us to look at our handset and therefore we see HP DIL low. We can troubleshoot this as a human because we can check if the cylinder is on, we can check if anything like an isolation slider is open and therefore the gas can access the unit when we need it. Same system for the O2 in which case it would say HPO2 low. Um, now, I think we've got five minutes to go, so we'll skip that video and I'll move on to the next slide, whereby we look at something that tripped us up. Um, oh, we are going to have a video. Okay, so we'll have that slide. Okay, well, great, we'll go on to this. So, these error messages across the middle are an attempt to turn an alert for status into something understandable in plain English which should tail into a specific procedure which you've been trained to do easily. Except that when we put all these text messages up here, everything we wanted to know about had O2 written in it. And this seemed awesome to all the test subjects. And when we, yet when we come to run lots and lots of different courses, we get a student who says, I saw HPO2 low, PO2 low, that's bail out, right? And it's not. It means check your O2 bottle is on, maybe it's been knocked off, Maybe you missed it in a pre-dive check or the onboard checklist you didn't do correctly here, but here's the catch up. And we found that having low PO2, high PO2, high CO2, PO2 no com, HPO2 low, PO2 back low, dill PO2 high, possibly made for more confusion than we intended. Uh, and this is something which now needs to be slightly overcome. So some honesty there uh, for that one. We thought this was gonna work really well. And in fact, the solution contained another layer of issues for us to uh, attempt to deal with, but we're on the track case. Uh, systems now being simplified to get rid of the uh, configurations which cause some of these alarms making it easier. So at the end, we have a summary that human factors are highly relevant in CCR systems. You can see from those two examples how usability and um, Communication information is essential to that perception, cognition, action sequence for us to adapt to our diving operations. Uh, that system and those systems and the human factors in those scenarios have evolved beyond the current BSEN 14143 scope and specification. Basic human factors physiological support is comprehensive, but we need to bring usability back up to the same level. There is a lot out there now whereby we could move towards 
I know human factors metrics is a bit of a contentious issue, but we could certainly put more detail in there and more qualitative indications of what's going on. The EN standard should include human factors in the FMICA, but it doesn't specify it and it would be strengthened if it did. Uh, specified practical performance has HF weaknesses in terms of the team members and the setup. They can be overcome by a responsible human factors aware team, but why not specify it in the actual standard? Now the solutions lie in the testing and education. We can't possibly pretend that this EN standard would address all of the issues that agencies could bring to the table with their training uh, and we can't provide a one-size-fits-all CE out the box good to go. We have to combine this with training which addresses the human factors if they're in the standards with human factors components from the training. That'd be amazing. So I think that lots of exciting developments should lie ahead. We have ISO standards coming up for rebreather the training. If they match up the human factors component in CCR testing, then we truly have a step forward in CCR safety and user enjoyment, which of course, the crucial thing is to give us more tools to explore the ocean and my own particular passion, which is human science and scientific diving. More data, better conservation, healthier planet. We can take that right the way back to how our rebreathers are tested. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Uh, please attend the I have a question table. You'll find it in the map oh. of the conference hall. So everyone who has been attending this presentation is invited to, to join us on stage and put <coughs> questions forward to Tim. After your presentation now, Tim, what do you think you missed? I'm interested in human factors, you know. Do you, did you forget something? Uh, yeah. I definitely yeah. forgot what for. I had that written down on a different piece of paper and I've left okay. it on my car at home. So that's, <laughs> that's an absolute sitter there. Um, okay, we have questions. We'll go to, uh, I'll just have to invite them to stage. Please uh, wait for... Andres. Um, Andres. Welcome. What question do you have for Tim? Um, I gladly listen to the presentation and uh, I understand the idea of bringing the human factors into CCRC testing, but um, what do you think wouldn't be bringing the human factors into the rebreeding rebreeder training a step that should be taken um, before they? But what when not before? I I think that is the other half of the same coin. Um, Looking at the Red Bear and its upcoming development into another rebreather, a new educational program, then I'm, I'm very interested in how we revisit the materials that we give to agencies as a manufacturer. So I'm going to sit here with, with two hats on at the moment. One as the representative of, uh, of a rebreather development and secondly uh, as uh, an IANTD IT and part of the UK licensee team. So going around the table of various agencies and we you approach them with your manufacturer hat on and say okay what would you like from us and they say well we have a generic set of slides on a rebreather and then we just sort of stick the manufacturer slides on the back but if you don't educate students to be aware of their human factors weaknesses and the human factors challenges that are different to open circuit we're not really accessing uh, the full range of education we need to make people more happy on their rebreathers and we all know that the pyramid of rebreather diving starts up in lots of people who are like this and it flattens off very rapidly as people fail to get over that initial hump whereby they become comfortable divers. My own approach is that training consists of downloading an awful lot of information to a diver, installing a bunch of skills and mentoring them to implement those skills in diving scenarios and operations. And that's where really that's that mentoring bit falls into the relationship between the student and the instructor. That's crucial because it's a long-term thing. But the other parts of it could support that with more human factors and agencies. Now, of course, the little workaround is that if you identify human factors in the slides supplied by a manufacturer to an agency, then the responsible manufacturer who wants people to have a better time diving on their unit could actually influence that educational process via uh, instructions for their specific machine. So there's a little little back door there, but really 
agencies should get on it. Um, I've looked at uh, Gareth Locke's the Human Factors for CCR training, and I'd love to implement that from an agency level to actually match up with what might come from the manufacturers. Hmm. All right, thanks. thanks. Uh, who'd like to ask a question next? Uh, I think I'm green, Tim, so I'll go for it. <laughs> um, just looking out to your, uh, your your slides on the the HUD and uh, the handset, uh, I was attending, I can't remember if it was a Eurotech, another conference, and another manufacturer suggested that one evolution of uh, error messages on uh, the handset should actually include an instructional component beyond just telling the diver what's wrong, actually telling them you should do X now. And I was wondering how um, you, uh, from the from point of view of developing the Red Bear and, your, and any other units, how you feel about that? Okay, well, I, one of the things I didn't get a chance to touch on is of course the problem that comes up with the size of the handset and technology is advancing. Um, if we've got a handset, which is a big thing like an iPhone, or a small thing, you know, like a sort of credit card size thing, which is more convenient for, for an arm, um, then that is a constraint over what can be displayed. And this is where we have to make choices about streamlining. And this is, of course, where everybody diverges because everybody would like that streamlining to be done slightly differently. And we've got the example of the Mark VI, which has a lot of error codes on a big paddle. And some people love a paddle and some people don't. Some people love having a nerd with the numbers up here. And we took the choice to make it a status LED, which was used in conjunction with this. In terms of going on to saying, do this, I think if you recognize that there are a number of circumstances that could have brought about the change in status, unless you can predict what those circumstances are, you could be possibly uh, giving a student or a diver the wrong information about the action required to uh, rectify it. So um, instead of putting error codes up, we put clear text up to make it easier for someone to perceive. And then the cognition comes as a result of training and you know, ongoing diving into a safe action. Uh, for example, if it says, turn your O2 cylinder on, but you've got a shut off in place, then turning the O2 cylinder on won't solve the problem. You're still going to become more hypoxic. If it says, open the cylinder, check the slider, then we've got more on the screen and we've kind of then fought something else off. And really, we still want to display our PO2. So if we go back to that, PO2 is still there. Um, if the PO, if in that kind of a resource alert for low cylinder pressure or the cylinder being mm -hmm. turned off, the PO2 becomes critical, that overrides that blue message with a red alert. Mm -hmm. So you can put some tearing in definitely to focus on the most urgent thing, fix that urgent thing, discover the other things behind it. But I don't think we can predict as manufacturers what all the, the rich scenarios are that people are going to find. I think that is where training has to go hand in hand with it and experience and mentoring. Tim, well, we have time for the last questionnaire is uh, Dave, please. Um, well, First off, Tim, it, it's wonderful to see the platform moving forward and in, in developing so much over the years. It's, we were involved with it way back when, and uh, this is light years different than, Thank you. than it was. Um, just a couple of comments. I mean, I think that one of the things that CE could do that would be really helpful is to just sort of standardize information provided to divers across platforms. You know, I mean, there's always been talk about standardizing Smithers codes, for example, but, yep. um, you know, other things, I I almost died because I was in a situation where I had a, a dual sensor failure, but the information provided said cell millivolt error, and that was logged as a non-critical fault. And um, the platform that I'd been diving before that said bad cell, check cells, you know, and so... Yep. Clear, clearly, it's my responsibility to know the information that's being provided and, and attach, uh, you know, relative importance to it. But it seems like if there was a kind of standardized set of information provided that transcended platforms, that would be helpful. And then I think the only other thing I would say is, 
is part of the CE testing should be all of the scenarios, all of the information um, provided yes. to the CE testers to make sure that they can actually understand it. I mean, what the hell does uh, cell millivolt error actually mean? You know, and, and finally, I would say also, you know, the other part that we're not talking about is that some of these errors and faults that will show up um, actually impact the cognitive ability of the yes. divers themselves. And, there, you know, you can't reason through a whole long list of stuff if you're hypoxic. You know, you need a straight bailout now or something. Yeah, like that. absolutely. That's that would work for the red alarms um because that is the instruction that that red alarm means so from when uh, i think you had a, a, a sentinel a long time ago didn't you um so the number of alarm codes on the sentinel were was enormous and it includes some of the ones that you mentioned the manual was twenty five thousand words of engineering speak and it took me a month to write it down to about fourteen thousand words of of usability um it it was a long long old process back in 2015 to get that to make it more usable for divers. I totally take your point about um, standardizing information. And I think the standard could address that by talking about PO2 information and CO2 information being the most important things. And you don't have to mandate a sensor for everything if manufacturers choose not to. But if they are there, then they should have a specification attached to them in terms of the information that they have. All the standard says at the moment is, active warnings. So if you've got a CO2 sensor, it should work. That's it. But it, it doesn't specify whether it should trigger a bailout or just a, by the way, tap on the shoulder in, in that sense. And it should do. And it also doesn't specify uh, the level at which those alarms should go off. So 1.6 is a clear one, but we can have a debate over 0.4 um, or 0.5 or something like that at the lower end. 0.4 is right. I'm, I'm really sorry to break up this party because it's interesting and I think that our attendees have been enjoying your conversation and the presentation, Tim. Thank you once more. Okay. Uh, you could meet Tim in the uh, conference lobby. There is a, a area called the speaker from previous uh, speaking uh, speech in, uh, in Hall 1. We have to clear the stage now, guys, to make room for the next presentation. So thank you once more. Tim, and thank you all the questions. Thanks very much, everybody. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, yeah. Gareth. Bye-bye.